Okay, so we'll make a start then. So um, a big welcome to everyone today. It's really good to see you all here. Um, thank you very much to our wonderful Luminar guests as well, um, who finally give, who've kindly given up their time to speak to you today. Um, all the speakers are University of Manchester graduates, which means they know exactly how you're all feeling right now. They've all been in your shoes and they'll be able to offer you some excellent tips and advice. So please do ask any questions that come to mind. Um, because you have got a really unique opportunity today to ask our alumni anything at all that comes to mind. Um, anything about their sort of experience of the sector, roots into it, anything like that. Um, so yeah, please do have a think about what you want to ask them today. Um, and yeah, um, if you have any questions at all, please do direct them to Emma Roof and then she'll direct them on to me and then I'll ask them to the alumni on um, on your behalf. So without any further ado, I will get our alumni to introduce themselves. So I'll do it left to right the way it is on the slide. So Majid, do you want to start us off? Yep, sure thing. Thanks, James. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Majid Fastan Hag. I am a senior research officer in the customer lab at HMRC. Um, I did criminology, undergraduate, and masters. I think I graduated. Say, so think I graduated in 2017. Um, I did actually work at the uni for a year, and then I took a bit of time out because I didn't want to be an adult yet. And then. Uh, this is my third post in the civil service as a researcher, started in the Office of the Sentencing Council, then moved on to uh, formerly Bayes. I don't know what all the abbreviations are going to be after the, it's been separated, but that was the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And then now I've moved to HMRC. So, yeah, I've spent most of my career as a government social researcher and, uh, yeah, was at Manchester not, not, not to... Uh, not, not too long ago. Thanks, James. Thank you, Majid. So we'll move on to Alex. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, Majid, thank you for being the first person to make me feel old on the call after about two minutes in. Um, my name's Alex Veach. I'm the Director of Policy uh, and Public Affairs at the British Commerce, which won. I graduated at Manchester Uni in 2008. No, I didn't. 1998. Uh, I was giving myself 10 years. And uh, I've worked for a long time in, in policy, public affairs, and I've worked internationally and here in the UK. And um, I am very happy to be here to help, if I can, with graduates' career choices. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Uh, moving on to Jamie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Jamie. Um, I'm a I didn't think what my job is then, it's on the screen. Uh, I'm the Head of Widening Participation uh, for Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. So um, I guess just to explain a little bit about what my job is, because it's one of those things that people are like, what does that actually mean? Um, so my um, job is I'm based in the HR team um, at the the NHS Trust, so Manchester NHS Trust, one of the biggest NHS Trusts in the country. Um, and my team are responsible for kind of increasing and diversifying our workforce and supporting local people to access education and training opportunities. So we sort out things like work experience. We do lots of programmes um, around adult skills, trying to support local people that are unemployed, um, lots around disability, lots of different things around that. It's all about trying to help people access education and training opportunities, which is what I've spent most of my career doing um because previous um to working for the nhs um where i've been for just over two years i worked at manchester met university before that and then the university of manchester um before that again in, in widening participation roles and very much focused on i guess kind of taking national government education policies and, and trying to make that work um locally um, and help people um, progress their careers. So my actual first, second job after I left university was at the career service um, at the university. So kind of not unfamiliar to some of these events and things, and it's nice to be back and involved. So I graduated from English literature um, at Manchester in 2011. Um, so yeah, also feeling a little bit old, but <laughs> maybe not slightly less, <laughs> slightly more recent than Alec. <laughs> 
Thank you, Jamie. And last but not least, Lewis, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lewis Howells, and I work at uh, the University of Manchester as a business engagement coordinator. Um, so essentially what that means is um, I kind of facilitate the link between academic research at the university and local businesses um, in Greater Manchester. So for me, that's small to medium sized enterprises, they're called. So smaller businesses that are based in Greater Manchester. Um, I graduated from uni back in 2017. So the same as Majid, I studied music, um, an undergraduate degree. And then after that, um, I've worked in various roles at the university. Um, one role was a Manchester graduate talent role, um, which I'm sure some of you might be familiar with if you've been, um, engaged with the career service. And after that, I also worked at the career service itself as well. So again, these kind of events are very familiar to me. Um, and it's really nice to be back um, doing one from the other side, really. Thank you, Lewis. Um, thank you, everyone, for those intros. So yeah, now I guess it's over to you guys as a student to ask any questions that you might have in mind. Um, just a quick reminder for anyone that might have joined later, um, please direct your questions towards Emma Roof. Um, via direct message and then she'll relay them to me and then I'll ask on your behalf. Um, if we don't get any questions immediately, don't worry, I can ask some in the meantime while you're having a think. So, yeah, I guess we'll um, get the ball rolling that way. So, to start off with, anyone can jump in on this one. Um, what is a typical day like in each of your roles? I don't mind um, starting with that one. Um, so I, I think I've been quite fortunate in that the majority of jobs that I've had in my career, it's been very varied. So I don't would never say that I have a kind of typical, typical day that's the same every single day. But that's why I guess I've kind of fallen into the role that I'm in, because that's what I wanted. I didn't want to be sat at a desk all day, every day. Um, doing things so my 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 workload is quite varied so it'll start with and again the pandemic's changed things as well so my typical working day now compared to um kind of pre um covid kind of three years three three years ago this month isn't it it's a long time now um would have been very much kind of get into the office there uh, kind of nine o'clock um various kind of emails face-to-face -face meetings attending events and things whereas now um i still attend events, have lots of meetings, have lots of emails, <laughs> um, but I work quite a lot more flexibly at the moment. So it might be something like when my alarm goes off about seven, um, might have a quick look at what emails and, and things that are going on. Um, then I try and fix some exercise in or, or do a bit of a walk or just to try and kind of get like physically moving. So I think working from home, sometimes you don't move about as much and that's not very good um, for your well-being or, or for your health. Um, and so some, I'm normally in the office a couple of days a week, at home a couple of days a week, and then out and about at various different meetings and events. So, um, yeah, it can be really varied and tend to start time, finish times. I think I've become more fluid in my role because of the pandemic, but I think that actually helps me with my work-life balance that I actually like perhaps being able to kind of dip in out and I'll go and do the big shop normally on a Monday afternoon. <laughs> I do my big shop. So after this, I might go and do the big shop. Um, but then I'll work kind of till about six and different meetings happen at different times and things. So sometimes when I've got a focus piece of work to do, I might do that at a time, like maybe like eight till nine when I know I've got no meetings or kind of like five till six in the evening, um, just when, it, when I work best, really. But I'm sure Thank others you. do different things. Thank you. Um, so we've actually got a couple of questions from the students coming in now. Um, this one's for Alex, but after Alex has answered, I guess everyone could sort of dip in on this one. Um, so Alex, um, one of the students was wondering, how did you get into working for an international policy making organisation? And is there anything that you'd do differently in terms of like your route into it? Oh, right. Thank you. Um, so I had a bit of a convoluted route. Um, there's some things that I would recommend uh, and some things I would definitely do differently. So um, I uh, I wanted to be an environmental campaigner um, and 
I remember, and I did politics and modern history at Manchester, and I remember going to see the careers advisor and, and they didn't know what I was on about. <laughs> I was talking about sustainable development and all that. And um, they advised me to go to the civil service and try try the fast stream exam. Um, and what I, I actually did, I did try that. I got through the exam and I failed the um, interview uh, recruitment sort of two-day interview thing that they did. And I, I think they still do something very similar. So one thing I would do differently about trying to work in policy is I would not have given up. I would have gone again for the interview. And I think um, it's really important to be, um, to just keep knocking on the door. Because I would say, if you want to get into policy in any capacity, working in civil services is, is really good. Um, and Majid might, might, might well want to, want to comment on this, whether it's in the fast stream or direct entry. So um, I would I would do that differently. I'd give myself a bit of a kick up the backside and do it again. But what what I did did work in the end. But the thing I did that I would really encourage others to do is I did internships. So I, when I was doing this over God, 25 years ago, they're not always they didn't have the same stuff about being paid. So I did a volunteer placement at an environmental charity in the UK. And I did um did something through a British University's North America club. I'm not sure it still exists, but I did. Um, I got a work visa to go to the States twice. Uh, once when I was still a student, and once when I was when I graduated, and I worked in American nonprofits. So I started working. My 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 job for about three years was in the States, having gone there the first time. So do do one thing I did that you should do is do internships, um, MPs' offices, think tanks, um, business groups like mine. If you're in Manchester, there's a Chamber of Commerce, they're really good, they might do something. Um, and please, please, please don't give up on the first hurdle. If you get knocked back in an interview, don't, don't give up, keep going. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Majid's got his hand up, so I don't know if you'd like to chip in there, Majid. Yeah, I was just going to build on what Alex was saying. Uh, I definitely agree with the point around internships. I think they're invaluable. I think it's kind of one of the primary ways you can get an idea of how any knowledge you're learning in academic sense is applied in a practical sense. But on the point around, and this applies more broadly to civil service applications, civil service fast stream is obviously a fantastic opportunity. But like Alex said, if that is not the only route in, there are heaps of civil service posts, um, just direct general entry posts. So if there's one tip I can leave you with if you are considering a career in the civil service set up job alerts on the civil service jobs website um, you know if you have an interest in social research set up the appropriate criteria for that or for policy like Alex was saying because I think the number of students who and rightly so they try for the fast stream but maybe they don't make it through and then think that's their only route cut off don't don't feel disheartened if that happens because there are so i mean the vast majority of people who come into the civil service do not come in on the fast stream so it, it, it's not the only way definitely not for grads uh i i didn't get in on that way i came in on a direct post and i've hopped around since then uh so that was just that was just to build on alex's point a bit thanks james thank you for that majid and we've got another question through for you majid um did quantitative research techniques play a big part in your undergraduate or master's degrees? And how much do they feature in your day-to-day -day work? It's a good question. So in, in relation to the first part of that question, uh, quant, quant skills did play a big part. Um, they were kind of the catalyst for my career. So the criminology degree at Manchester, at least this is how it was when I was there, uh, in your second year you do a introductory data analysis course and then off the back of that you, we were then offered the ability to apply for QSTEP internships um, and I secured one of those it was in the College of Policing which is a civil service role did that for eight weeks over the summer and that was very much the springboard for me to say I actually think this could be a really viable career um, so yeah, quant skills and that definitely gave me the foundation and then the masters built on those quite considerably. In terms of how much I use now, the unit I'm in does quite a lot of qualitative work, although I'm helping to build out our quantitative capabilities, but in my first post in particular, so in the office of the Sentencing Council, 
I was doing a lot of statistical analysis, a lot of survey work. So yeah, it really, it really came into play a lot. I think it does depend on what kind of role you go into in civil service. But yeah, if you're a social researcher, then it will, it will be of great use and has been for me. Thank you, Majid. So this next question is open to anyone. So any of the panelists can feel free to jump in. Um, so this one's from Freya. And do you find that the companies and organisations that you work for have a good working environment and ethos? And have you found any specific benefits from your company? Um, for example, maternity and paternity leave, paid leave for volunteering, any training schemes? Um, I can answer this one, maybe. Um, yeah, I would say that the, the university has a very good working environment, actually. Um, and it's really a place where you're made to feel like part of the community, which I think is very, very important, um, even with hybrid working and things like that. So uh, my role, for example, is a mixture of working from home and being in the office like I am today. Um, but there's very much a sense of community um, within the university. Uh, in terms of specific benefits and schemes, I can't really say that I've accessed any of the ones that you've mentioned, for example, but I know that they are available and it's essentially a good idea to always take advantage of those kind of things, but also to be aware as well of things that you want and make sure that, that if there you do have any needs that you kind of articulate that to your managers because people don't necessarily know that you want something unless you ask for it. So. That's another piece of advice I, I'd give as well is to always, you know, if you want something kind of outside of your, your job or from your employer, there's no harm ever in asking for it. Thank you, Lewis. I can see Majid's got his hand up. Um... Just to add, from a civil service perspective, I can't comment on uh, maternity and paternity leave, just because I can't remember. But the... The things that are on offer, I, I believe it's two days a year we can take uh, volunteering leave. Um, in ter I think the one thing that people tend to, ter to point to in terms of like uh, benefits for civil service is the pension, which is quite boring, but you appreciate it later in life. But in terms of, I think the tangible stuff that you can benefit from as soon as you join, uh, the key thing is flexible working. So most most people, at least, you know, m m quite a lot of civil servants will have access to flexi time. So being able to start and finish um, flexibly. Um, but then also there's myriad flexible working arrangements. So I work something that's called compressed hours. So I don't. So I work a nine day fortnight. So rather than working Monday to Friday every week every second week I have a Friday off so I just do more not more hours for nine days and then every tenth day every tenth working day I get off stuff like that you you don't tend to think about necessarily when you're a grad because it seems kind of boring but then when you get into your day-to-day -day working and having that kind of circuit breaker on a Friday and they're not impacting your pay or you know if you've got caring responsibilities there's flexible working arrangements that can help accommodate those so I think those are some of the real real working benefits that you can see and in terms of the working environment people I work with are great very encouraging very supportive big culture of feedback and big culture of supporting you to develop as well thanks Majid and then we'll go to Alex with your hand up thank you um so I'll, I'll give you a bit of a wider wide, wide view um as the sort of uh, old codger on the call, um, I think things have got uh, moved on a lot now from from when I was young. And, and I mean, my kids are nearly at uni application age. Um, and now you've got things like parental leave is more shared between both parents, which it wasn't when I was uh, when our kids were really young. Um, and, and I think just in my day job, we we obviously represent lots of businesses and uh, I've done this kind of business rep stuff for, for 15 plus years now in this, in this part of my career. And I've seen flexible working get much uh, more progressive over the years. And now that we're at the minute we have a big shortage of people in the UK, it's quite a good, um, it's, it's made it quite quite a lot, I think, better, comparatively better for people to 
to have more flex in their in their job. So I think you know, um, I, I think I think it's there. You can now request flexible working at the start of your contract as well. It doesn't mean they're so yes, but but I think businesses are open to doing. Th- so let's say they not, may not be paying as much as you'd like, but they might well give you give you some flex. So it's really really worth asking, um, as Lewis said, um, worth asking about it when you're in those conversations about about work and then the final comment is all that said it does depend on the kind of job so if you go into policy and politics civil service my partner works in civil service and that that's the best i've seen about flex and uh, yeah she does a nine day fortnight as well it works really well um if you want to be a special advisor to a government minister you might want to set your expectations a little bit differently about that uh, if you want to work in parliament similarly i wouldn't expect the same kind of flex and um <laughs> Uh, sociable hours uh, careful what I say but um, and obviously gr- some graduate careers are, are well known for being not brilliant about working people really really hard so I won't sort of go there but um, y- you've definitely got a better I say it, it, the sort of structure around it is better now for young people coming to, into workplace than it was certainly um, you know when I was coming through thanks thank you um, so this next one um, I'm guessing this one's for Alex as it's about uh, policy. So the student says, I'll be graduating this year with a degree in educational psychology and I'm interested in policy making. However, I find that a lot of policy makers come from an economics, political sciences or public policy backgrounds. My question is, what pathways are available to be involved in public policy within education? For context, I'm planning to do a master's as well. Uh, well, there's loads. There's loads of there's loads of ways you can go. Um, I mean, uh, civil service is a really obvious one, um, and and I mean, Madge, Mad, actually, I'll come to you on this. I, I, you know, if you could probably look at direct entry routes into the Department for Education, um, that that uh, I'm, I'm willing to get your take on that. Madge, there's a way in, but just just to finish off, outside of civil service, there is a huge. Um, if I say the word ecosystem, you, everyone will cringe immediately. But there is a huge kind of ecosystem of policy going on in education, uh, whether that's think tanks, uh, whether that's charities, campaign groups, uh, more formal research institutes. Uh, I'm afraid it's a case of patiently looking at all of the players in that game, um, and and contacting them and seeing what they've got. See if you can drop in, do an internship. If you're doing a master's, see if you can do your your thesis, your dissertation around the topic they're working on. Um, some of the chambers of commerce, I was talking to one yesterday, just the end of last week, who's 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 working with a master's student because their thesis fits some of his business objectives. Um, but you've got to do the homework and find out who is doing education policy, and then contact them. Um, and that applies to everyone on the call. If you if you want to get into a specific area of policy, that's good because that gives you a focus. But you've got to reach out. You've got a network. You've got to contact them, um, offer your thesis time, see if they do internships. No one's going to give you anything, right? You've got to go. You've really got to go and push. Go go and push it. You really have. Um, but there's definitely a way in, and people will see you're interested, and that really does count for a lot. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And then we'll go to Jamie with your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to kind of add to that. So I'd put in the chat before that I actually applied for. Um, a direct entry um, to Department of Education policy job um, a few years ago. It was when, um, which I was saying before, around BIS is changing again. It was when it used to be BIS and they moved higher education from BIS to DFE. <laughs> Um, so lots, there's always lots of things going on um, and I kind of felt that I'd kind of worked in education for yeah probably longer than five actually it was probably longer than five years at that point I'm just trying to think um, but I felt that I'd gained quite a lot of knowledge of education like on the ground and that's kind of I felt like policy was where I could make most change <laughs> because a lot of the roles that I'd done in education were very much like enacting the policies that had been kind of decided elsewhere um, but I've got a few friends that have kind of gone into policy roles um, and again it's through I guess there's kind of like I said before there's different routes in and like Alex has just said it's not just in the government department like so there's a lot of charities and think tanks and the other thing as well is to think about kind of devolution agreements as well so in I, my have always worked in Manchester and Greater Manchester um, but Greater Manchester have got quite a lot of devolution particularly around education and they're pushing for more 
um, at the moment around like technical skills and skills reform and things like that. So like as Alex has said, that it's not just about that way in. And I think it's just about managing your expectations that I think I perhaps had a lot of ideas and always been quite enthusiastic and about about how education is important and all this kind of stuff but my work in in education has kind of shaped some of that and that experience has contributed to that so I think it's trying to think about stuff as short-term medium and long-term goals and actually if that's your kind of long-term goal the, there are kind of various different routes in and like I said in the chat before I still think policy is perhaps where I need to get to to make the changes that I think need to happen um, and it's kind of a never say never but at the moment where I am just going back to the question before around flexible working and job security and all that kind of stuff I know where I am I could do condensed hours like Majid's mentioned I could drop to part-time if I'm thinking about starting a family all of those kind of things so where I'm at in my life right now the job I've got in the public sector is quite good um, for that work-life balance but I know again I've had other jobs in the past which haven't been as good and that's not been very good for my health so I guess yeah just a few comments on a few things that have been mentioned. Thank you um, and then this next question I guess um, I'm going to direct this to um, every one of the panellists because it'd be uh, good to sort of get an insight into how this is in each of the different sectors so the question is, what do you expect or like to see or want to see on university students' emails and applications when applying for work experience and internships with your companies? I, I don't... I'm sorry, you go. You go, no, I, was you go. Gonna, I was going to say, I think the one thing I think that would be common everywhere is, I know it's a pain, it's the same as when you're applying for jobs, but and you, when you're in a position where you're trying to get experience, so sometimes you maybe don't care where the experience is, you just need to get some. Um, employers want you to care about their it, like about their company and their business so make sure that you actually even if it's just a couple of sentences like oh I can see from your website you do xyz or just like changing like the name of who you send it to the more tailored you can make it to that industry or, or organization the better but obviously mindful that you're going to do that it's going to take you quite a long time to do that so I wanted to work in publishing and I contacted every publishing company in Manchester of which there are only five um so that was that was a bit easier <laughs> Um, but I did tailor it to all of them. I managed to get work experience at three of those five um, and ended up not working in publishing. But that's a different story um, that I do for the English lit grads. <laughs> that's some really useful advice. Thank you, Jamie. Does anyone else have any insight that they want to chip in with? Yeah, yeah, it, Alex. I, yeah I mean, James, absolutely bang on. That That is brilliant advice. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of really boring advice. Proofread it. <laughs> Don't send something off that's really enthusiastic and and succinct and gives you and, and then just just leave some really clear and typos. Get get a mate to read it for you because um that's what the, it, it's just an immediate red flag if somebody's making errors on the on the application. So but yeah, um, choose a sector you're passionate about. Get that across in a letter. Don't don't give up. Look look around who who else is in there. Contact them all. You've really you know offer to intern offer make an offer make a suggestion if they don't have a scheme for grads or internships offer offer them something and you know, make an make an ask um that that really shows um that you you actually want want to go and work for them thank you um does majid or lewis have any sort of advice to chip in with i i i'm happy to come in i'll i'll tweet my answer a little bit by saying i think the internship and work experience opportunities in the civil service they tend to be quite slightly more formalized schemes um so i think the kind of broader stroke of advice um i won't reiterate what jamie alex has said because i think that's the golden rule is not to just send something flagship to everyone that you're interested in but i think for the civil service it's really key to know be aware of the behaviors framework there's a very specific way to apply for civil service roles, um, be it internships or all the, the like grad schemes, whatever it might be. It's a very kind of specific application process. So I think do your research on it and don't approach it like a typical application. Um, there's a particular way you should 
probably write things you, you have very limited word counts so you're not trying to write something that's the most articulate and beautifully uh beautifully written thing ever it's more so showing your competencies in quite a direct way so it's a very particular way so i think do some research on that that would be my biggest tip which kind of starts to lead into applications more broadly for the civil service but i think for work experience and internships it will likely be the same advice too thank you majid okay so the next questions for lewis um what was the application process for the university internship program like and do you think it's necessary to do the internship program to quickly put progress at the University of Manchester? That's a great question, actually. Um, so the application when I did it, um, I don't believe it's changed. It might have been kind of the last year that I've not worked at careers, but definitely up until um, this time last year when I I'd still worked it, it was the same. So it was to submit uh, your CV and a cover letter, basically. So. Um, a cover letter is just a single side of A4, basically explaining in a letter format um, why you want to roll outlining a bit of your experience and kind of linking it to what they would like um, in the role. So that was the application process. Um, one thing that's important to note as well is that I used um, the career service application advice um, service to go over those applications. Um, and had a lot of help there in terms of refining them. So I'd encourage everyone to do that um, for kind of whatever role you're applying for really. Um, but it was very helpful to me in that role. Um, and what was the second part of the question, James? Um, do you think it's necessary to do the internship programme to progress quickly at the University of Manchester? That really depends on personal circumstance. I can't kind of give an answer that will be appropriate to everybody there um, but definitely if you want to try out working in higher education um, because it'll typically be something like a year-long contract um, if you want to try out working in edu uh, higher education I definitely recommend doing it but I wouldn't say that it's essential um, higher education is perhaps um, a sector where it can be quite a closed sector, like people will tend to specialise in higher education and kind of remain there for most of their career. Um, so in that sense, yes, but also I wouldn't say it's essential either. Um, the application process for roles at the university that aren't internships is quite different. Um, not necessarily better or worse, but just different. Um, but yeah, I'd encourage everybody to consider it at least anyway. Um, because it does give a good opportunity to get an insight into it. And then you can decide after kind of that year whether that's a sector that you're interested in working with. Thank you, Lewis. I can see that Jamie's got a hand up. Do you have anything to add there? Yeah, so I actually did too. It used to be called something slightly, it was used to be called Manchester Graduate Internship Programme back in my day, but it's, it's the similar, um, I think it sounds like it's changed a little bit, but I actually did too. Um, internship roles. So my first one was in the private sector, um, working for a local engineering company in marketing. So my publishing work experience that I mentioned previously, most of it was marketing based, even though it was in the publishing sector, it was kind of a marketing role that I did. Um, and when I was applied for jobs, I kind of knew I wanted to stay in Manchester when I finished uni. So all the publishing companies, apart from those five were in London, those five were like, yeah, no, we literally never hardly ever have any jobs like keep an eye out but <laughs> thanks for your work experience so I got a job for an engineering firm um, <clears throat> and that was like a, a quite a short contract like a four-month contract so like Lewis had mentioned it was kind of yeah just a, a, a covering letter and a CV and I actually applied for quite a few of those roles but that role came to an end um, and then that's when I kind of started working at the career service to so again my role at the university career service I think it's probably the same one that Lewis did I just did it a few years after uh, you did it a few years after me sorry I should have said um, and that was again that kind of simple process but I stayed at the university for five years and then I worked at MMU for six years after that 
Um, so I would say a lot of people that I met um, working in the university, like the internship at the university is quite a good springboard. Um, and I know people who've gone on to do various different things. Quite a few people um, have, mo have moved into, I was in a management role, kind of moved into senior management roles. Um, but like Louis said, it's not the only way in. Um, it's just a kind of, I guess it is, a, it sometimes can be a bit of a springboard because at the university, I think most of the departments treat it a bit like a grad scheme. So like with the civil service, fast stream like you go in um and like the nhs we've got a management grad scheme you kind of go in kind of with fairly limited experience but that is all about trying to give you lots of experience and lots of exposure to help you kind of progress um your career so those programs are very much designed to kind of progress people so i found when i was an intern um at the university I was perhaps doing work that was perhaps above the kind of entry level role that I was in but we were doing that within a supported way and we were giving exposure to lots of different things and lots of different tasks which again um internships have been mentioned in terms of like summer internships and doing dissertations like all these things that you can do it's just trying to make the most of opportunities and I think there is a bit of a line to be had between being kind of perhaps exploited and doing things that you're not being paid to do um and working kind of outside of what what I guess what you're being paid for but also I think through taking opportunities and actually say, getting involved in stuff that's helped me in my career to actually progress um, at the rate that I have because I've actually taken up opportunities and actually said, oh, I want to get involved in that, kind of find out a bit more about that rather than just kind of waiting to be asked if that makes sense. So I guess that would just be a bit of advice as well as is, is trying to take opportunities. And Alex, what you said before around like looking at your dissertations and projects and internships and Majid, like that's really good um, advice if you can build that into what you're doing now as well. Thank you, Jamie. That's some really good advice there. Um, and for the next question, I think this might be um, quite a good one for Lewis and Jamie to answer. Uh, what skills from your degrees helped you get your role? Did you do anything outside of university to gain any additional skills? That's a good question again. Um, so for me doing a music degree, um, I guess um, people might assume that that is just sat playing an instrument for three years, but actually I did very little of that. Um, what I kind of specialized in, or focused on more in my degree, I guess, was kind of the wider applications in music. So relating to things like sociology, philosophy, um, and that sort of thing. So very much a, a humanities degree um, from the angle that I did it as opposed to like a, a pure kind of arts degree, um, although there was that element of it as well. Um, so yeah, skills that related to it. Um, there, there's a lot with music that relates to pretty much every kind of job. Like you, if you perform with people, you have the ability to sit down with a load of people that you've never met and somehow create beautiful sounding music together by either looking at some stuff on, on a page or by talking to each other. And that's a, that's a pretty amazing skill to have, right? That you can do that. Um, that shows teamwork, that shows collaboration, that shows your ability to interpret things. Also shows your ability to create as well. A lot of the degree was creative. So you had that aspect of having to create something to a brief and that have been set by your lecturers. And that has served me really, really well um, in the roles that I do now as well. Um, so there's a lot of things, even though it doesn't sound like it's maybe directly related, there was actually a lot of stuff um, that I covered in my degree that I do use now in my job. Um, I guess extracurricular stuff. Um, I was always doing lots of music, always playing lots, always kind of, um, running music events and things like that and those skills not only do they look good on a cv but they also equip you with kind of lots of skills in dealing with things that might come up in the job as well like i i didn't really have any proper work experience in terms of internships um and stuff like that it was all that extracurricular stuff it was playing in bands it was organizing concerts it was kind of i was like a resident musician at a restaurant for a while um so all kind of not really typical stuff, but stuff that did actually help me in my job because you've got that teamwork and skills. You've got the ability to show that you can plan stuff and organize events. So from the extracurricular side of things, there's quite a lot as well that, that really helped me. Thank you. 
Lewis, I think that's some really useful insight for humanities students around sort of the transferable skills that they can use to get into different job roles. Um, Jamie, did you have anything to add on that question? Yeah, so I guess, so I didn't, I'm trying to think now about extracurricular. I do a lot of extracurricular stuff now, um, which I'm like, yeah, trying to withdraw a little bit from just because life's getting busy. But um, kind of since I started working, I've done things like I've been a school governor um, and a trustee of a mental health charity for about 10 years. So I've kind of taken the, oh, let's do extracurricular stuff to help me progress quicker once I've left work. But whilst I was at uni, um, I had a part-time job in the students' union working behind the bar, um, but I did like kind of the work experience stuff. I got to Easter of final year and was like, ah, I really don't want to move home. Like, what can I do? I need to try and do something to try and get a job and like started coming to loads of career service stuff. But I guess in terms of transferable skills from your degree, so if someone had asked earlier about kind of quantitative and qualitative research methods and all of that kind of stuff, which for, I guess, me and Lewis were more, perhaps more like arts, humanities students doing English lit and music, not even kind of like the social science humanities where you actually sometimes get an M a, a BSc, not a BA. Um, but I did maths A-level, um, which has come in more use um, than I ever thought it would, because my job actually, there is a lot of like data analysis um, and things like that, which I didn't really get in terms of, I guess, quantitative data analysis, which I didn't really get from my English degree, but a lot of the kind of qualitative stuff, I guess, understanding different people's backgrounds. So again, the stuff that Lewis had mentioned around linking it to kind of like, I guess, theories like philosophy, kind of like social kind of stuff that was going on. Um, so a lot of my work now is, is very much about understanding kind of people's backgrounds and, and the, perhaps some of the adversities that they've, they've faced and why that might be and some of the structural inequalities and things. So um, like things like Marxist theory and feminist theory like actually do come up quite a lot. Um, and it's things that I was like, oh, I studied that and I remember that. So um, and communication as well, like Alex had mentioned before, like you actually like proofreading stuff and being able to kind of write very well. Um, I think it's a bit of a skill to kind of learn how to write in a business way and actually being succinct and actually kind of keeping things to, particularly like for policy jobs, I imagine there's a lot where it's kind of some ministers will literally won't even read longer than a paragraph, not even one side of A4. Sometimes it's two sides, but obviously it's there's a lot of background work that goes into condensing things down. So I think those written um, and verbal kind of those communication skills are really really important because that's what a lot of this is about I guess in the public sector it is around kind of communicating ideas and taking concepts and and making them understandable. Thank you Jamie. Um, can, so, can I just say a word about extracurricular just in case anyone here wants to go into politics or work in public affairs um, one thing I, I regret is that I didn't get involved in any of the political stuff at uni um, you definitely meet people on the political scene who were at, um, you know, involved in the student political parties. And I also meet people quite a lot who were, who, especially on the Labour Party side, who were in, involved in the National Union of Students in some way. I'm not saying there aren't people in the Conservative Party who do that, by the way, but um, they do pop up quite a bit on the Labour scene. Um, so that if you want to get into politics or if you want to work in politics, I would strongly recommend you do some um, political activism to the uh, colour of a uh, flag of your choice. Uh, that is that is really, really good way to network. Thank you, Alex. And then this next question is more of sort of a policy based question. Um, so how do you recommend finding the right sort of internships? Are there any particular places that they're advertised? And um, yeah. Is there any sort of particular websites or anything that you might find policy internships? Okay, my my data on this is years out of date, so maybe others can help on the website stuff. But but my take, I think, like a few of us were saying before, is um, if you if you've got a topic in mind, that is a huge help. So you know, I knew I wanted I'd done humanities, but I wanted to work in environment. So I just looked at a bunch of environmental places and I, I found Friends of the Earth. So I'll kind of, kind of work with you for the summer and they did have a volunteer scheme. So um, it, if you don't have a topic, then that is quite hard. So um, maybe think of something you like, <laughs> but but there you'll find, <clears throat> find organisations in that space and then you'll just, 
have to contact them but others may may well be able to help more than me in terms of where some of these things are listed because i'm afraid i really don't know that one cheers thank you and then we've got another one for you here alex um was it easy to secure an internship outside the uk like in america as you mentioned how did you find out about the availabilities well actually there was a, literally a book um in the careers library at so I did my master's at SOAS, you know, School of Oriental African Studies in, in University of London, and they had the careers office there. So I went to the careers office and I looked it up. But there were also some American students on my course, on my master's course, um, who told me about internships as a thing, which obviously was a huge has been a huge thing in the States for years and years and years and years. And it's kind of I've seen it slowly catch on here in the UK. So, so he, it was harder here because I had to find one, to go to Friends of the Earth, to contact them. They were they were sound as a pound, and I was I wasn't the only one doing it. Um, but the US that is it, that it's very structured, and there's a whole program of cohorts of people coming in and out of DC for the summer. Um, but the tricky thing is getting the visa. So if that whole system still exists, the BUNAC, I, I, honestly, I'm so old, I don't know if it's even still a thing now. But I did it twice and it gives you a work visa on the basis of being a student or at that point being a graduate for a short time. Then I had to get another visa. That was the only hard bit was convincing them that I, I, I actually had the legal right to work there. So that may have all changed. But getting the information about it is was is loads easier now because you've got the Internet, which was uh, <laughs> uh, for some parts of my career. We In my uni days, we didn't even have the Internet, believe it or not. But uh, uh, it was coming by 1990, 2000. But, um, so, yeah, but you've got to find know what you want to do find the um find the organization and then look what they've got thank you um so this next one's for majid how do you think your postgraduate degree helped you to get into your role would you recommend students interested in a research role to do a postgraduate degree i for me personally the emres i did that was also at manchester it was a great help because i think that your the undergraduate degree you, you're you covering a lot of the theoretical and that, and that continues in the masters but they begin to bring in a lot a lot of the practical elements so you go further into how to plan and design chronological research uh, we did more advanced quantitative data analysis we actually had a whole unit on qualitative data analysis and a unit on evaluating policy and practice so all of which are i can kind of di draw direct paths from that kind of learning to things i've then carried on into my role so for me personally it was it was really valuable that being said i don't i'd feel disingenuous to just say yeah go ahead and do it because i think more and more now any kind of postgraduate study there's a considerable economic decision that comes with it so um i think that if a career in research for example is something that uh, you want to pursue as a student then an mres might be something uh, you should uh, genuinely consider but i think if it's something that you're kind of thinking oh maybe i just it it yeah maybe it just makes sense to do i don't know what else to do um i, I th think think it over considerably because you know it is more debt you're taking on um the studies are really valuable but i don't think it should just be a shotgun decision at the same time a very balanced answer there thank you majid um and this next one's another more policy-based question um uh, is there a place for hospitality and or labouring roles on your CV where you can describe the transferable skills or is it better to focus on your academic and university experience when applying for public sector and policy roles? Is it okay if I come in on this one? Yeah, go for it. Thank you. So I, I, I don't think there should be any kind of stigma about referencing those roles. I think that's, you know, if you have particularly if you're doing those kinds of roles to get yourself through uni, they, they, there is no, there, there is great value in, in referencing those. Um, I mean, I, I had a part-time job at Subway when I was, it was in my second year because I wanted some money on the side. 
Um, now they embarrassingly called us sandwich artists. Do I refer to myself as that uh, on my CV? No, I tend to admit that part. I think I would just say food, food services assistant, but I think it helps to create a fuller picture. So, you know, if you have worked at a bar, I think it's not necessarily the bar work that is what they pick on, but it's the fact that you've balanced bar, you've balanced the part-time job alongside your studies. And if you're excelling academically and you've then got those part-time jobs that you've balanced at the same time, I think those are skills that you should be drawing upon. Um, but it is a bit of a balancing act. You may not want to include everything, but um, definitely, definitely don't feel like they, they, I think they definitely do have a place, hospitality in those service roles, retail, whatever else it might be. They have a place on your CV and they can really demonstrate some valuable skills and experience. Thank you for that insight. That'll be really useful for all the students to hear about who've got part-time jobs and things like that. Um, I can see that Lewis has got his hand up. Do you have, any, have anything to add there? It's just a second that really, like, absolutely put it down because there will be stuff that's relevant in that experience. Like, as I said, I didn't have a scrap of, I guess, office-based or kind of more professional work experience before I started my job. Not, not a minute of it. Um, and all I used on that application was the extracurricular stuff that I'd done that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, it wasn't like directly hospitality, I guess it was working in a restaurant kind of, so it was kind of related to that, but, um, definitely because ultimately a job description, if you're kind of applying for a role, um, that's formally advertised, not something that's speculative where you contact someone and say, is it possible that I could maybe do an internship in this area or whatever? If you're applying for a role that's advertised or an internship that's advertised, um, they'll basically tell you what they want you to, to have or what they want the, the successful candidate to have in the job description under the essential skills section, it will be called something like that, uh, essential skills and attributes maybe. So they'll essentially tell you what, what they want you have, to have done. Um, all you need to do is use whatever experience you have to demonstrate that. And essentially, that's the way to apply for a job, basically. So absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Lewis. Jamie, do, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so my current role now um, in the NHS, I actually am part of our like wider resourcing um, service. So I guess just from a kind of like HR recruitment point of view, um, a lot of, like, again, Lewis has already said, kind of you need to be looking at the kind of specification and, and showing that you meet that. But I, I think that there are a lot of our managers that I work with that they do prefer people that have got experience of being in a workplace, regardless of what that workplace is, um, as opposed to just putting down the kind of academic stuff. But I think that it's, again, it's about kind of a balance or the types of roles that you might be applying for. So you might be applying for a job, I don't know, that says you need to have... Um, you need to have done a certain kind of study where you've actually done so like the kind of quantity the research method stuff or kind of you can use um there's all different data sps all the different stuff that you do if you do um economics like all the different software so obviously that that's important to include but i think there's no harm in, in again if you've had a part-time job as well because it shows you've got some of those other kind of software transferable skills but i think it gets to a point where i don't put my like my jobs like that and my work experience, like I've had enough, I guess, jobs now where I don't need to fill my CV out with that. But when you're just starting out, that experience is still really valid and really important. And I do think, don't underestimate, it's like, oh, I only worked in a, a bar or I only did this, but actually you can show that you're in a workplace and actually you've got some of the skills that employers are looking for um, that necess not necessarily study will give you. So stuff like actually turning up on time um, because uni aren't like they don't always check when you don't turn up but like in jobs like you have to turn up and um, so there's all kind of stuff like that so I would say definitely include it and just going back to the bit about postgrad study all the postgrad study I've done has been through work um, and paid for all through work either as an apprenticeship um, or just as kind of CPD so there is that option as well just to think about um, it's a bit of it if you don't ask you don't get um, but I did um, a master's in project management when I worked at MMU that they paid for um, because I asked. I said, I'm in a project management role. I've got no 
like kind of formal qualifications like is that something you can support me to get and they said yeah we've got a master's in project management off you go <laughs> thank you jamie so um this is the end of the q a part of the session before we end today um just to sort of end on like um sort of a high note um i want every single one of the panelists to sort of give us what they enjoy most about the current role and their top piece of advice for all the students in this session. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot a bit there. I don't mind going first. Um, so my uh, thing that I enjoy the most about my job and all the jobs that I've had it is, it sounds really trite, but it's, it's about trying to help people get to where they want to be. Um, and that's something that I learned motivated me. Like the, working in the private sector, making money for people didn't motivate me. Um, helping people and working in the public sector does motivate me. And my top piece of advice is that you can't teach enthusiasm. So um, you can learn how to do stuff. Like I'm sure I could probably learn now some of this quantitative research method stuff if I did want to move into a policy research job. I, I don't. I think I could do it. I could learn how to do it. But if I'm not enthusiastic about it, that's quite hard to teach someone. Um, so enthusiasm is key, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, favourite parts for me about working at the university is learning. Um, I love learning and I learn every day and I'm surrounded by an environment where everybody's learning. And that is what I love about working at the university. Um, my top tip would be use the career service because honestly, they have resources out there, support available for everyone. And pretty much regardless of what sector or area you'd like to go into, whether you'd like to go onto a postgrad, um, I'd advise everybody to definitely engage with the career service. Um, most of you probably are because you're here, but tell your friends who maybe aren't, um, give them the nudge as well. Thank you for the shout out, Lewis. Majid or Alex, do you have anything? Yeah, I can go. Uh, so I think what I enjoy most about my job and my career, I think, is how varied it's been between the posts. I think what I'm enjoying most about the job currently is being able to do primary research and with, with an impact as well. Um, and the flexibility of it all. I think my my tip that I would encourage people to take away is don't worry about getting it perfect first time. And what I mean by that is I think there's a lot of pressure to pick the right the right grad scheme or the right job and get it right first time. I think the the reality is that most people nowadays they have such varied career paths and such a breadth of different experiences that the likelihood is you won't get it right first time. You may very well do, and if so, I tip my cap off to you, but you may not get it right first time. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to try different things. It's good to learn what you, what you don't like in a role just as much as what you do like in a role. And so, yeah, don't, don't, be, don't be worried about getting it exactly right first time. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah, quick, quick thought for me. That, that's such a good advice already. Um, what I enjoy is, is this diversity of, of the job personally. Um, although I know a lot of other people that work in policy, particularly uh, are, are sort of focusing, so they might love research, but apply to policy. They might love public affairs. Uh, they might um, love the writing. Um I, I quite like arguing the toss with people about policy issues. That's what I really like doing. So um, uh, that's that's my sort of uh, particular en enjoyment. But um, in terms of what sort of one bit of advice, um, it's if you can have a sense of of of, of it's easy to say, it's very hard to do a, a sense of where you want to go, what you want, where you want to get to in your career. That that is a huge benefit uh, so if you know you want to work in at, you want to change the policy around education that's what you want to do in your working life then you can build things around that with that as the kind of thread that runs through it and I think people that I meet who are struggling a bit uh, I mean I've been in this boat my, my career's gone all over the place um, but one thing that's really helped me a lot 
is I know I want to get to this point or I know I want to work in this particular area and I've used that as a, as a guide um, and so even if you take I mean matches right if you, you, you'll end up with jobs that take you in all kinds of places probably but if you've got a, a, a goal in mind somewhere that will really really help you uh, in the end. Thank you Alex and yeah just to wrap up I'm just going to echo what Emma put in the chat we did have quite a lot of questions today and we didn't manage to get round to them all um, so on the slide that everyone will get sent there will be a link to everyone's LinkedIn so if each of the panelists are happy then you could reach out to them on LinkedIn connect with them maybe ask the question there and yeah that's it for the session thank you to all the panelists and thank you everyone for your questions and yeah see you all again soon